Good morning. Good morning. Uh, about seven out of ten. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. Um, when I was here last a few weeks ago, I spent a fair bit of time reintroducing myself. I'm not going to do that uh, today. Uh, just a couple of bits of information about me for some of you that uh, may not know me or may not be that familiar with me. I have been a pastor here at Greenville Baptist Church for just under 30 years. But these days, most of my time is spent working outside of the Greenville Baptist Church context. I am a campus leader for Four Mission College. I run their campus in central London where we deliver a BA in theology and mission and various other courses. I'm also doing uh, doctoral research at Roehampton University and uh, where I'm looking into the development of multi-ethnic congregation. And uh, that's the area of my, of my research. And this morning I want to continue to share with you some of the things that I've been learning as I've been studying in this last year and, and reflect with you on Greenford Baptist Church. Now, here is a warning, and it's an official warning. So um, I'm going to ask you some questions when I go through uh, this morning. And uh, they aren't you know, your standard preacher's questions because I want some answers. Uh, now, I am uh, a research student, I'm doing a doctorate, and so I have to be very careful with ethics stuff. So here is some ethics stuff. If you, aren't, if you, you don't have to answer any of my questions, but if you do answer any of my questions, not only will your words appear on our website, because this is being filmed this morning, but I may also use your words in an anonymized form in papers and articles that I write. So if you speak, you give me, that is, you giving me consent to use the things that you say. If you choose not to speak, that's absolutely fine. But I just need to say that um, I have got a, I don't want to, I think I'm a 24-page ethics statement, which uh, I've had to work on with the university to cover the various things that I'm doing over the next few months. And that's a part of that. Now, this is part two this morning. And, and it sits, the reason that we're doing this slightly earlier in the meeting than uh, otherwise is because it sits really well on the back of what we've done this morning in celebrating communion the way that we've done that and singing that wonderful song, Amritavani, and uh, with the uh, sitting on the floor and just that, the drone sound, the drone sound, of course, stands for the presence of God. And uh, so this really sits on that uh, really well. But it's part two today. Part one was last time. So uh, I'm not going to repeat from last time, but we need to have a little bit of a recap. So what were some of the main things I talked about last time? The shirt is a clue, all right? Because I wore this shirt last time, and this shirt's quite significant in terms of what I was talking about last time. So who was here? Some of you weren't here. Who was here when I was here a few weeks ago? Uh, okay, that's some of you. That's good. So I talked last time about what? Can you remember? What was the main thing I talked about last time? Pastor Warren, you were here. Tapestry. Tapestry. So we talked about tapestry being a picture, an image, a metaphor for the church. What's, what's important about tapestry? Um, can I get to you? I think I can. So, yeah, Marcia, great. All the distinct colours and patterns are kept, um, but when they come together, they create something beautiful, but they're not merged together and lost. Brilliant. Absolutely wonderful. You listen really well. So the distinctive thing about a tapestry is that it's the difference between the different threads that makes the picture. And we talked about last time about how uh, we, we, uh, I went through a whole series of New Testament passages. If you want to hear it, it's on our website. I'm not going to repeat it this morning. Showing how this particular image, this picture of tapestry is one that is biblical and it's one that helps us. And we talked about how it's through our relationships together that actually we reveal something of God. Through our difference, an image of God is revealed. If, if we were all the same... We don't get a picture. Yeah. I went to an art gallery the other day, or the other day, a couple of years ago. It's one of these modern art galleries, and there was this picture that was just blue emulsion on a wall. I'm thinking, I don't quite get that. 
Uh, I've got a wall at home like that, you know, <laughs> blue emulsion. But it, it's, in the, it's in the difference that the picture is revealed. And that we reveal something of the image of God. So that's where we're, where we're going. And as I say, last time, if you didn't listen to part one, I really would encourage you to listen to it. It's some really important stuff, not just about biblical teaching, but actually about the church here. So I'd encourage you to go back and have a listen to that. It's there on our website if you've not heard it before. Now, you may remember last time. Now, I should warn you, by the way, I'm going to touch some really painful issues today. Uh, That's a serious comment. I'm going to touch some really difficult issues, some really painful issues. This is going to be a bit uncomfortable at times this morning. And I make no apology for that because there are some times in life we need to name things and face up to things that are difficult. And uh, we can just skirt around them, but this morning we're going to touch on some of those. Now, you may remember last time, you may not because I passed over it very quickly, I said that when the first people who were not white British, first adults who weren't white British, came and joined the church, they were Caribbeans. And uh, remember I talked about the fact how we had a hairdresser just uh, a couple of hundred metres away and she told people about Jesus and they started coming to the church. In fact, in the congregation last time was the very first convert, Caribbean convert from the hairdresser who got sent here, became a Christian um, and uh, she was the... uh, one of the first Caribbeans that I baptised in the church here. And I mentioned that as those adult Caribbeans came into the church, there were some issues that began to emerge that were quite difficult, but I didn't explain what they were. So I want to talk about that. See, I became aware, as I visited these uh, Caribbean uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in their homes, I became aware that they were experiencing attitudes and behavior within Greenford Baptist Church, which they felt was racism. They were on the receiving end of racism. Now, I have to say, I don't like the word racism. Um, I try and avoid using it because I believe, in fact, there is only one race, the human race. That's it, one race, the human race. I prefer the term ethnic prejudice. And we're going to explore what that means a bit later on. Um, But racism is a term which a lot of people use. So if I'm reflecting other people's views, I'll use the word racism. But when I'm talking about my views, I'm going to talk about ethnic prejudice. Okay, so one race, the human race. Amen? We'll come back to that later on. Now, they found themselves feeling uncomfortable within the church family here. In fact, they felt that they were not fully welcome. They talked about the fact that what they described in their words as their blackness was not welcome in the church family. And they felt uncomfortable. So and they talked about comments that were made, um, well-meaning comments. I can use these people because they're my friends. So, um, you know, sister, um, I just see you as my sister. I don't see you as black. Now, The white person making that comment might well have been well-meaning. But what was felt on the other end, and Carleen wasn't here in those days, so this isn't a personal comment on Carleen. They felt, actually, I am black. And I'm proud of my culture. I'm proud of the fact that I'm black. And the fact that you don't see that means that you don't actually welcome a really important part of me. And there were many other examples as, as well that they, they talked about. They, they were used to being in society where they experienced racism on a daily basis in all sorts of different ways, all sorts of different situations. But they were horrified, but perhaps not surprised when they found those same attitudes cropping up within the Greenford Baptist Church family. So I want us to talk this morning about uh, ethnic prejudice, about what the Bible says, about how the metaphor of tapestry can help us. But before I continue, I want to acknowledge that I'm uncomfortable. Some of you are looking pretty uncomfortable as well, but I'm uncomfortable talking about ethnic prejudice for this reason. I am, as you might notice, a white British male. You know, I'm just stating the obvious. And... uh, who throughout my life has benefited from the privilege of being a white male. And I'm going to come back to that later on. 
My whiteness and my maleness gives me privilege and power just because I'm white and male. And uh, I've never been on the receiving end of racism. It's something that happens to other people. And so I find myself a little bit uncomfortable talking about it. However, my discomfort is no excuse, really, for avoiding talking about a real and challenging issue. And I'm going to come back to the issue of my white privilege later on this morning when we're beginning to come to the end of what I'm saying. So let's have some scripture. Turn with me, please, if you've got a Bible, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Um, Sir, could you possibly get me a glass of water? That would be really helpful. Thank you very much indeed. I thought I had one, but I've mislaid it. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, and I'm reading from the standard version that we use in the church here, which is the New Living Translation. And I make that point for those that are watching this on the video for this morning. That is the version I'm using because it is the version, standard version used in the church here. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Can we just say that verse 27 together? Right, because this is really, really important. So if you've got a different version, you just say it in whatever version you've got. If you've got the NLT, uh, that so much the better. Here we go. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, uh, some volunteers. Carlene, uh, Humphrey, Kashela, Sabrina. Can you come and stand in a line here, please? Thank you. They did know they were being asked, by the way. So in case you're thinking, is he going to pick on me next? You're safe. Well, ish. Unless you're a leader in the church when you get picked on anyway. Okay, Carleen, in which country and city were you born? Kingston, Jamaica. East Africa. Kuching, Malaysia. Kumbu in Cameroon. Okay, so, and I was born in Guildford in the UK. So four, five, one, two, three, four, five different people coming from different parts of the world looking quite different. Now, we are all equally created in the image of God. Male and female, black, white, brown, we're all equally created in the image of God. Now, that might not sound to you here at Greenford Baptist Church like a revolutionary statement. But let me tell you that a lot of Christians, let alone other people in our world, do not believe this to be true. I'll say that again. A lot of Christians in our world, let alone other people, do not believe it to be true that we, male, female, black, white, brown, are equally made in the image of God. But it is a biblical fact. And anybody who believes different is actually wrong. And we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Now... Um, When you look at a really nice artwork, perhaps a sculpture, some 3D artwork, when you look at it from one particular direction, you see a particular image, and it strikes you as something, doesn't it? Yeah. But when you look at it from a different direction, you see a different image, and you get a richer picture, don't you? Yeah. So... Us five here, and we, we, you know, I could have picked other people from the congregation, different people. Us five here, we do look a bit different, don't we? Now, together, now get hold of this, together we, ref, we reflect something of the image of God more than any of us do by ourselves. Together, We reflect something of the image of God 
more than any of us do individually. We make a nice picture together. In fact, we could be a tapestry, couldn't we? We could be different threads that together make a picture, which any one of us on our own doesn't. Now, in our world, there's all sorts of ethnic prejudice that goes on. It's not just about white people like me and black people like Humphrey. It goes on also between Caribbeans and Africans. If you come from either of those things, you will know some of the issues that go on there between Africans and Asians. You will know there's a whole range of different ethnic prejudice that is around. You will know there is between other Caribbeans and Jamaicans, for example. Loads and loads of different ways of ethnic prejudice that is around. But we, together, are all equally made in the image of God. Amen? Amen. I want you to affirm that. We, together, are equally made in the image of God. Amen? Amen? And together... We reflect more of the image of God than any of us can do by ourselves. We're going to explore that a bit more this morning. Thank you very much for being one. Give them a round of applause. My wonderful visual aids this morning. Now, let's go on in Genesis to what is a really difficult passage. And um, I need to address this this morning. Uh, Turn with me to Genesis chapter 9. Now, you will be familiar, most of you, uh, particularly if you are black, you'll be familiar with the teaching of the curse of Ham. And uh, we're going to read it, and uh, and then I'm going to make some comments on it. So Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 to 27. The sons of Noah who came out of the boat with their father were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. From these three sons of Noah came all the people who now populate the earth. After the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. One day he drank some wine he'd made, and he became drunk, and he lay naked inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw that his father was naked and went outside and told his brothers. Then Shem and Japheth took a robe, held it over their shoulders, and backed into the tent to cover their father. As they did this, they looked the other way, so they would not see him naked. When Noah woke up from his stupor, he learned what Ham, his youngest son, had done. Then he cursed. Now notice these next few words really carefully. Then he cursed Canaan. Who did he curse? Can you just say that again? The son of Ham. May Canaan be cursed. May he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. Then Noah said, may the Lord, the God of Shem, be blessed, and may Canaan be his servant. May God expand the territory of Japheth, and may Japheth share the prosperity of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Now, this passage has been widely used as the the biblical justification for enslaving Africans to serve white people. And the way it's interpreted, wrongly, the way it's interpreted is as follows. This curse was not just intended for Canaan, so the argument goes, but for all the descendants of Ham, The term ham, so the argument goes, means black or burnt. Therefore, this passage explicitly refers, so the argument goes, to all black people. And in it, God commands that they, black people, be slaves to white people. And uh, you'll find that still if you go to some Christian bookshops you buy a commentary on Genesis, you will still find today on the shelf books that teach that. And it's a view that is still held by quite a lot of Christians in our world. 
Now, there's some really complex issues in the interpretation of Genesis 9 and 10, which I really don't want to go into this morning because I'll be here for the rest of the day. But I simply want to point out two things that are actually quite obvious. Firstly, the curse was not pronounced on Ham. Did you notice that? Who was it pronounced on? And there's a whole story with Canaan in the Old Testament, which if you know the Old Testament, you know about. So it wasn't Ham that was cursed. It was Canaan that was cursed, who was a son of Ham. Secondly, the evidence for Ham meaning black is, to say the least, a little um, dubious. It's based on a supposed connection an etymological connection between the word ham and an Egyptian word that means black. Yeah, you think, so what? Well, um, there weren't any Egyptians around at that particular time. In fact, there was only one language. This is before the issue of the Tower of Babel. So it's very clear everyone spoke the same language. So to get that interpretation, you have to jump forward a number of hundreds of years and take a word from a different language and then go all the way backwards and say, oh, that's what it meant. Which is a little on the dubious side from my perspective. So in my opinion, without going into all of the very complex and other difficult issues with chapters 9 and chapters 10, I want to make my understanding very, very clear, having looked at this really carefully. The interpretation of this passage as a justification for enslaving black people is a vile and perverted attempt by some white people to justify a grievous sin against people made in God's image. But it was a reality in our world for many years and it continues to be a reality in our world today, we have clearly seen that the Bible teaches that we are all equally made in the image of God, all human beings. We're going to pick that up a little bit later. But I want to remind you of a passage that we read last time in Revelation chapter 7. I have to say, this is one of my favourite passages from the Bible. Revelation 7 and verse 9. And I, I keep going back to this because when I look at the reality in our world at the moment, it, at times it is horrible. So I like looking at our destiny, where we're going. Amen? I talked last time about, I, I do a lot of walking um, uh, Leslie and my wife and I, uh, when we're on holiday, we often do um, long hiking and often in mountainous areas and we might walk for well, all day, um, you know, 15, uh, sometimes as much as 20 miles. And uh, you, know, you, you see, you, you're getting your two-thirds through the day and you're beginning to feel just a bit on the tired side. And in the distance, you'll catch a glimpse of where you're going. I'm thinking of a particular walk we did the last, uh, last time we were walking. We actually got a bit lost as well, trying to find our way across this rocky plateau. I've never seen so many rocks in my life. And we were going towards a particular castle, which came about half an hour before our final destination. And we suddenly saw the castle. And I had more energy in my legs all of a sudden. When you see, the de when you see your destination... Well, brothers and sisters, this is our destination. After this, I saw a vast crowd. This is heaven. Too great to count. From every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshipped people from every tribe 
and people and language standing there in front of the throne, worshipping God. You know, there is something about us joining together. When we were this morning in, in our worship, we've drawn on a number of different uh, ways of worship. Singing the song in Hindi this morning, as we were, most of us, sitting on the ground with the uh, drone sound in the back, Amritavani, together. In, as we dig into different cultures and, and other ways, we reflect more and more of the image of God. And I made the point last time that our ethnicities are eternal. Our ethnicities are eternal. Why are they eternal? Because they reflect something of the image of God. In heaven, it's not a load of white people. I'm sorry to tell some of my white brothers and sisters that. Heaven is not filled with white people. People from every, every, every tribe and nation and tongue will be there. There will be some white people there, but an awful lot of others. In fact, the others will probably be in the majority. And this comes back to this tapestry metaphor, because in a sense, when we're built together as something that reflects the image of God in our tapestry in our local church, it's an anticipation of heaven. We're revealing something of God now, but actually we're also anticipating heaven, what theologians call realized eschatology, a taste of what's to come in the now. In the same way that in so many ways in our praying for one another, we're pulling stuff from heaven into our present experience, God's peace, God's presence, God's wholeness and healing into now. This is a part of that as well, grabbing that from the future. But let's think about some of the problems and stuff that we, that we face now. Let's think about ethnic prejudice. Hmm. I was uh, in another country a little while ago, uh, within the last two years. Now, the context of this is that I, for decades, have been someone who actually is active in... Um, I'm an anti-racist. Uh, you know, as someone who's campaigning against racism in so many different ways. I'm sitting in another country. I'm in a region where English is not spoken. And it's a small hotel. I think there were about four or five people staying in this hotel. And I'm sitting in reception, and, uh, which in this small hotel is right next to the check-in. You know, I'm sorry, I'm sitting in, in the lounge next to reception. And this lady arrives, and um, as I said, English really wasn't spoken, and uh, she had uh, a phone with her, and so she was speaking into her phone and getting her phone to translate into the local language so that, people, so that she could actually check in. Quite a smart thing to do. And I heard the accent, and my heart sank. I'm being really honest with you here. As I heard that accent... My heart sank. I thought, oh no, not someone from coming into this hotel. And then she got her passport out, and I recognized the passport, and my worst fears were realized. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that I'm experiencing what some might call racism, I would call ethnic prejudice, towards this lady who I've never met. I know nothing about her other than the fact that she has turned up at this hotel that I happen to be staying in. But I have formed some view of her based purely and simply on prejudice. So what do I do with that? I was shocked at myself. Okay, I'm shocked at myself. So I decided, in the custom in this hotel, I'd been there for a couple of days, was that before dinner, the guests uh, came into the lounge and the hotel provided a, a free, well, free, it's part of, you pay, you get it because you pay to stay there, but give you, a, give you a drink before dinner. 
So I decided I was going to come down into the lounge and make sure I sat and talked to this lady before dinner. And she was one of the most interesting people I met when I was away. And she was in this hotel for a really fascinating reason to do with her history. She'd never been to this region before. But there was a particular reason she was there and she told me the story. I, it really enriched me. One of the people I, I uh, read earlier this year talks about ethnic prejudice, talks about racism being like a poison that's in the air. We, we live in it. It's around us all the time. But that poison exhibits different symptoms in different people. So here's a slightly risky question. Um, I think both of my questions are a bit risky this morning. So here in West London, what are some of the ways that we observe ethnic prejudice around in West London? What are some of the things that we see? I thought it was a bit of a risky question. So, uh. I suppose when um, a race populates an area, some of the indigenous people tend to leave. Mm -hmm. yeah, what's what they call white flight. Yeah, yeah. I saw a hand somewhere. I didn't see whose it was. The language barriers. Okay. She's speaking different languages. Okay. I often hear people saying about people from abroad taking English people's jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that whole concept of foreigners taking our jobs, how English people express it, yeah. Come on, what else? We live in this all the time, brothers and sisters, so I know it's a bit difficult to name some of it, but let's get some of it out. What else have we got? Hmm. I um, had instance where someone told me I am superior to you because not because of the job we are doing or not because of anything else but because of the because of our colors so a white person saying to you they're superior it wasn't white okay so a different is saying to you they're superior to you because of their skin color yeah yeah often thought rarely spoken out but uh, I'm sorry if this is a bit uncomfortable, but um, I do uncomfortable. You might not invite me back after today. You often go in, into shops and people pretend that they don't understand you because you have a foreign accent. Yeah. Yeah. Having worked for um, two charities now, um, I often hear the phrase that is overused and completely wrong, charity begins at home, i.e. help our people first, that kind of attitude. And that's very interesting because there's this, this concept of these are our people and these are other people who are not us. We're going to come back to that later on because that's really significant. You are overlooked for increment or promotion. Thank you. I could tell you from people that have talked to me lots of other examples of, of uh, people. Um, you know, we're talking about in the local area here, um, people being uh, people who uh, look uh, Asian or Middle Eastern, being spat at as they walk down the street, um, told to go home, stuff like that. Um, I have uh, friends, I, I have uh, never, um, I've lived in this area 30 years, I have never been stopped by the police when I've been driving. I have friends who have a different skin colour to mine, they have, and they drive like I drive, so I mean they're not, they're not nutters, and they have lost count the number of times that they get stopped. 
and so on and so on and so on. I mean, you know, we, we could, I could sit here and, and list. You, you, you look at the proportion of the prison population against the population that's not in prison, and you see there's a massively disproportionately number of people with black skins in prison. And you ask the question, is that because um, they are naughtier? The answer, no. When you look at the actual data, you discover that when you are convicted, first time convicted of an offence, if you've got a black skin, you're far more likely to get a custodial sentence, be sent to prison, than if you've got a white skin. That is a statistical fact here. And so on and so on. I mean, I could just go on and on and on. This is part of the stuff that we live in. And I, I think that this metaphor of tapestry, this understanding of tapestry, can really help us tackle this fact that we live in a, a, a context that's full of ethnic prejudice, that's full of racism. Because ethnic prejudice works around the way that we construct the other. I was reading some research, um, I need to watch the time here, so I'll make this very brief. I was reading some research uh, recently that was done in Leicestershire. And it was done about, about among white English people uh, looking at how they thought about Asian people. And the people in this particular part of the research, they'd never actually met an Asian person. They'd only seen them. They'd never had a conversation with one. They'd only seen them apart from a couple who ran the local shop who were Indians in their background. And, and they had all of these ideas about what Asian people were like, which were, and, and they'd constructed this other. They imagined what it was like inside their homes. Uh, I mean, just incredibly bizarre. I, and, but there's this construction of the other. So for me, I sit in that hotel. This lady comes in from this particular, particular ethnicity. And I have constructed what she is like from my own otherness, from my own prejudice that sits there. But the, the, tapestry, the metaphor of tapestry really undermines racism because of this. You see, in a tapestry, there is no other. In a tapestry, there is no other. There is only us. Because together, we reflect something of the image of God. And it actually begins to undermine that concept of otherness that gives us that space, if you like, to create ethnic prejudice. There is no other in tapestry. There's only us. And you remember my talking last time about that in a tapestry, it's not the thread that there is most of that is most significant. It's the thread that there is least of that actually gives definition to the picture. Have a look at some tapestries online. Go to Google, put in famous tapestry, and just have a look, and you'll see how that works. You get you know, often just a big colour in the background, lots and lots of that, but it's the, the colours that there is little of. I've got a tapestry in my mind at the moment, and it's got some horses in it, and, and uh, on the... Um, the bridle that goes across the horse's faces, there is this red. It's the only red that's in this particular picture. And it just brings to, 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 to sense that front of the horse's faces that's there. Okay, I'm moving towards the end now, you'll be pleased to know. So I can see you um, shaking your watch to see is it still going. Do you know, a friend of mine was preaching one day. Sorry, I, I've got to try and lighten this up a bit. A friend of mine was preaching one day, and um, he, he took his watch off, and uh, a guy was, he'd been preaching at this stage, I have to say, for just under three hours. And uh, someone else I know was in the congregation, this is absolutely true, was in the congregation, and took his watch off. He said, do you want to use mine? It's got the date on it. <laughs> absolutely true. Now, many years ago, I, I became uncomfortably aware of the privilege that, that my white skin gives me. Like, like many UK people of my age, I'm nearly 60, um, I grew up on a council estate without, as far as I recall, meeting anybody who was born overseas. My primary school was entirely white. 
at my high school, the grammar school I went to, there was one boy, as far as I remember, one boy that had a pale brown skin. I never got to know him, he was in a different year to me, so I, I don't know what his background was. Everyone else was white. And I, and I had no idea of how privileged I was. You see, being privileged means that doors swing open for you. You don't notice about privilege until the doors don't open. Whenever the doors open, well, that's just how life is. It's like the fish in my pond in our garden. Oh, it's Leslie's pond, really. Uh, we, we have, I'm sorry to have taken ownership of your pond. It's, 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 it's yeah, so you can clean it later, yeah. So it's, it's my wife's pond in the garden. It's a huge pond, 1,000-gallon pond, got 40-odd fish in it. And, and the fish don't notice the water until you take them out. And suddenly, they notice it's not there. A few years ago, I, uh, I took a sabbatical. I appeared a three-month study leave from ministry. This was the first I took. I'd been at Green for just for a couple of years. And I spent two months in South Africa. And I want to tell you two stories. One short story and one slightly longer story, and then I'm nearly done. I went to South Africa to explore racism because I'd begun to realise in the church here, for the reasons that I talked about earlier on, that racism was an issue, and I didn't know much about it, so I decided to try and do some exploration, so I went to South Africa. At that stage, Mandela had just been released from prison. Black people had not been given the vote it was a huge amount of violence. There was a general strike on across the country, um, uh, people demanding the right to vote. Uh, there was violence and shootings every day. It was an interesting time to be there. Uh, and I could spend the rest of the day talking about it. It fundamentally changed my life, that trip, and God's action in my life. Left me permanently a changed person. And it's long enough ago now that I can make that as an absolute statement. I want to tell you, Two stories, two of many stories. I was walking around a, an area with a, a black church leader uh, who'd grown up under apartheid. And um, I, this was the second day I was with him. And uh, he said to me, he said, you, I, I want to talk a little bit about, about what it was like growing up for me. He said, because I remember walking down this street as a child. And as I looked in the shop windows, I knew that none of this was for me. This was only for white people. And then he talked on about so many other things that he, as growing up, had seen. And he knew that it was not for him. This was just for white people. And... As you can tell, that had a real profound effect on me because, as you've noticed, I'm white. That was coming towards the end of a time of just over two weeks when I actually didn't see another white person for two weeks. First time in my life I was just immersed in South African black culture. I literally did not see a white person for over two weeks. Times I was in events with over a thousand people present and I'm the white person there. The local black people treated me so well, helped me so much to understand. I want to tell you one other story, which is very relevant here. Um, uh, my, Leslie and my three children, who were quite small, had come to South Africa with me. They, they didn't travel around with me uh, all the time. Um, they didn't come to Soweto and uh, Johannesburg, Pretoria. Um, we, we'd, we'd spent two or three days in an area called Inanda. We'd gone as a family together. Inanda was the largest squatter camp at that time in South Africa. So it was huge squatter camp. People living, those that um, had the best houses, they were living in um, the packing cases that came from the Nissan factory uh, nearby. So the outsides of packing cases made into a, like a dwelling together and you'd, you'd have a dozen, 15 people living inside. Others were living in houses made of literally mud and plastic bags uh, together. And we'd spent three days just about wandering around, uh, being shown around different parts of that by different, different people. It was split between Encarta and ANC, and there was a, like an armed border in there and so on. So, so I'd spent, shell-shocked, 
You know, I, I, I'd seen this stuff on TV, but I'd never been there. And, and you sit and you talk to people, and you, and you see how they're living. And the next day, we were having a rest day. So we decided to take the children swimming. So we're in, in Durban, and um, we're there during summer here, so it's midwinter. Midwinter meaning it's like 25 during the day, you know what I mean? So uh, we decided to take the children swimming, go to the open air swimming pool, which is, of course is unheated because you don't really need to heat swimming pools in South Africa, except it's midwinter, so it was about 17 degrees, I think. So um, Leslie decided to go and swim and take Sam and Naomi, but Ben was only about two so we thought taking a two-year-old in 17 degrees swimming wasn't too smart. So I volunteered to sit outside. So I went and did that, and I bought a local newspaper, which was in English. I was sitting reading. And the area I was sitting was the most wonderful paddling pool I'd ever seen. I mean, it's about a quarter of a mile long. It had these wonderful fountains, water features. All around the paddling pool, there were lifeguards. I mean like every 20 feet or so, there was a lifeguard. All the lifeguards, of course, were black, and nearly all of them lived in Inanda. So they're standing around the outside. I opened the local newspaper. Now, in Inanda, I should tell you, there was there's no electricity, no sanitation. There was running water, meaning that there was a pipe that ran through, and there was a tap with someone sitting, and you could go and buy water from them. So I'm sitting there, open the paper, front page. Local council have announced a refurbishment of this paddling pool. And they were going to spend what I think in today's money would be the equivalent of around £10 million refurbishing this amazing paddling pool that was the best thing I'd ever seen. And I was absolutely shocked. Just over the hill were... Tens of thousands of people living in mud shacks without access to water, electric, and all the rest of it. And the local council, all of whom were white, of course, are going to spend all this money refurbishing this paddling pool. And all around this paddling pool are, are, are the lifeguards who live over the hill in Inanda. And I'm sitting there shocked. And God spoke to me. And... Um, uh, apologies if I'm, I, this is a really emotional moment for me in my life, so it was, um, God spoke to me, and he said, you, uh, you see, that this is only possible because of that, so this refurbishment, the wealth, the white wealth that makes that possible, is only possible because of what you've seen in Inanda, okay, I'm all right so far. And then God said to me, this is a picture of your world. What you have is only possible because of what white people have done in your world. And uh, it's still today whenever I, I, I don't often tell the story. Uh, most of you would have not heard that from me before. Um, but it was a a, a huge moment for me and, and it's, so it's particularly to white people either those here, those watching this that I, I want to address these next few comments as I come to an end you see the fact is that, that people like me I've been reading a lot in the last few months about white ideology and the legacy of empire and colonialism which includes the fact that I and people like me continue to benefit from the legacy of empire and the slave trade. I am richer today than I would have been if the slave trade had not taken place. We are as a country. And I benefit from that. I, I can't do anything about the fact of my privileged status. It, it goes with being white but I can choose what I do with it. I can't do anything about it. I've been I've torn myself up with guilt and all sorts of stuff over the years I've worked this through. I can't do anything about it. 
but I can choose what I do with it. Do I just benefit from it or do I use my position, my privilege and my power to work, to try and correct the injustice that is there so powerfully and so evident around me and in our world? You know, there is a calling over this church, over this church family, to demonstrate what reconciliation looks like. Part of our reconciliation with God is our reconciliation with fellow human beings. We've come a long way as a church family, a huge way in the last 30 years. But we're still on a journey. We need to continue, brothers and sisters, to respond to God's calling, allowing those distinctive threads to be seen as we work in harmony together, allowing God to weave us together into a wonderful picture that reveals something of what he is like to our society, to the people around us, to our nation. This, as we worship together this morning, and as we continue to worship together in a few moments, is an anticipation of heaven and at the same time a revelation of God on earth. After this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. And they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Singers, musicians, come and join me. Let's just take a moment to sit in a little bit of quiet. There may well be stuff that's come to the surface in you this morning uh, that's, that's difficult, that's uncomfortable, as uh, I've talked. You might want to just lift that before God. And uh, we're going to sing together in a moment. See, in response, when we look at this stuff, we can sit and wallow, we can feel despondent and depressed, or we can choose to worship God. And uh, we're going to sing a song that is a celebratory song. I'm going to divide you into two. So down here, if you could all stand if you're able to. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.